Hello. Welcome to Architecture Matters. My name is Cecilia Koro. And hello, my name is Lea Homadumo and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. Architecture Matters is a platform that we've created in hope of engagement and collaboration between staff and students. On this platform, we aim to critically discuss matters of care and concern in the built environment and architecture. Architecture can not only help, you, help us heal physically, but it can also help us heal mentally. Now, it can help us due to um, spatial elements such as light, texture, so many other things. In today's episode, we will be exploring the healing qualities of architecture. As Cecil mentioned that architecture can do so much more. With us today, we have very special guests and we have Roger Tyrrell, who's been an academic for more than 40 years and is the founding director of Cora. Welcome, Roger. Thank you. And we also have with us here today two BA3 architecture students. <coughs> Andrew Pezin and Joe Allen. Welcome, Andrew and Joe. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much for making time to be with us. So, as a case study to explore the theme of healing and breathing spaces in architecture, we'll be looking at the Maggie Center. Roger, do you mind telling us about what the Maggie Center is and why it was founded? Of course. The Maggie Center was named originally after Maggie Keswick, who was the um, partner of an architect and uh, architectural critic and author called Charles Jenks. Sadly, um, Maggie had a diagnosis of cancer and on one appointment with her consultant, uh, Charles Jenks and Maggie were taken into one of those really dull, lifeless NHS rooms that have no natural lighting. And the consultant sat behind his desk and very sadly communicated with Maggie that her condition was terminal. The consultant then asked Maggie and Charles to leave the room because they had more patients to see and they were ushered into a corridor sitting on hard plastic chairs where somehow they had to process that news that Maggie's life was not going to last as long as she would have hoped. And I think at that point, they both decided that that shouldn't happen to any other people. And that was a starting point for the Maggie Centre Trust, um, which was initiated by Charles and Maggie uh, and is still running to this day, providing care for people with cancer and those um, that surround those people. That's lovely. And um, how does one get to build a Maggie Centre? Who's built a few Maggie Centre if they do exist? Okay, well, Maggie Centres are um, built upon uh, the basis of need. So an identified need um, is made. And on that basis, um, renowned significant architects are invited to design a project in a particular location. The interesting thing about Maggie Centres is that whatever the location, the architect's brief is exactly the same. What's equally interesting is, given the same brief, how diverse the architectural outputs are. So if you visit the Maggie Centre in uh, Southampton, designed by Amanda Levette, it will be an entirely different kind of building to one designed in Edinburgh by another architect. But at its core, the same brief is attended to. That's really interesting. I think with that being said, do you think that architecture can act as a breathing space? Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, I think that architecture has, has many, many powers, but one of the powers it has is to, to calm, to relax, to excite, to stimulate. Mm. Yeah. And the brief for the Maggie Centre is very attuned to architecture's abilities to provide altered human states. 
That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Andrew, um, Joe, from yeah. your side, which spatial elements or which spatial devices can we use to really create therapeutic, calming spaces like Roger mentioned? How do you think we can achieve this spatially? Yeah, I think um, definitely, I think one of the best design tools we can be using is um, proportion alongside materiality. I think with proportion, you can really impact the emotional response to space and the spatial experience. Uh, we both had the very similar experience as we walked uh, through that threshold at the um, Southampton Maggie Centre. You're met with this not domestic height ceiling, just a little bit taller than you would typically be used to find. And as you enter that space, you, you find yourself taking a deep breath out. And that was, that was quite an amazing way how breathing space can be created through architecture itself. So for me, it would definitely be proportion as a design tool. I'd, I'd add to that is orientation. Um, for how you enter the building, how you experience that building, uh, can often be developed through the orientation of the site. Um, I think with the Southampton Maggie Centre, um, they utilise the different gardens um, uh, and the ability to look through the building and see these different areas where, um, as the orientation of the building, the sun comes round and the different seasons, they all have different experiences within that. That's lovely. Roger, tell us, how can we create an architecture of hope spatially? Well, I think all architecture should be architecture of hope. I think um, spatially in the Maggie Centre brief, there are some really key elements. And perhaps surprisingly, one is the kitchen table. Now, I think we could all perhaps um, relate to experiences where we come together and gather uh, in a family circumstance mm -hmm. around the table, and maybe grandma and granddad behind the table making some food, making some offerings, and perhaps the children and the grandchildren are there chatting or playing games. But it becomes a nexus for human interaction. Mm. So thinking about those very primal domestic spaces, I think is a really important part of the brief. So there's public space, but there's also very private space, very mm. intimate space. So a space that's just big enough for two people to come together, perhaps one's in tears, and the other is there to hold that person and support them. Yeah. Would you say any, one of the key things that needs to be considered in a space like this is elements like family, like family values? Yeah, I mean, I think um, <coughs> architecture needs to attend to emotions. Um, and architecture, I think, also needs to stop being or thinking of itself as an entity. It needs to think of itself as a connected ecology, which is part of a much wider thing. Yeah? yeah? So we need to think about, you know, architecture as healing. We need to think about architecture as a resistance to climate change. Yeah. It has all those powers. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Um, Andrew and Joe, how else have you explored <coughs> architecture in your academic journeys? I know that you're in your third year yeah. and you're in your exit level, you know, you're about to go to the real world or perhaps come back and finish your master's, but either or, you still have to step out there. And, um, you know, from your experience in dealing with the Maggie Centre, mm -hmm. what, what have you taken away from this project that you will forever um, replicate or you'll forever sort of keep with you, even in practice? I, I think it's the idea of, of humane architecture, it's like following off what Rogers just mm -hmm. said, is the idea that at the heart of architecture, we design buildings for people, not for the purpose of designing buildings. Um, they obviously have forms, they have functions, but they are inhabited by us, by humans. Um, and I think it's, it's up to us as next generation yeah. architects to look at buildings and go, how are people going to experience that? How, how do we want them to experience it? Um, and you know, with the aspects of climate change, you know, they should be influencing how, how humans interact with these buildings. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think something that I would definitely take forth from this brief in particular, being a live brief, when we're able to actually go and visit, is seeing the smiling faces using 
using a space that has been directly created from the brief itself. And I think trying to think past the design stage, I think, I think it's a huge factor, and we both mentioned it now, and I think that is the core thing that we've really learned from this brief, is really thinking past just putting pen to paper, thinking about what does it feel like to be in that space. I think that's, I think that's really what we'll be taking away from it. So. Well, speaking about putting pen to paper, we all know that um, we've just come out of a terrible pandemic and um, we all had to face COVID-19 and through facing COVID-19, um, certain things had to go on. Life couldn't stop, but definitely things didn't go back to normal, at least immediately then. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Andrew and Joe and many of their classmates had to really deal with this project. Now, the interesting thing is that um, part of the elements that they had to explore had to do with landscape, it had to do with light, it had to do with healing, and it had to do with um, anything that is rather more intangible in the architecture. So we've got a few models with us today, and um, these models were part of the exhibition, a recent exhibition at the Maggie Center in Southampton. And while I pass these around, what was it like, the irony of mm. The irony of dealing with a healing space where you're all in isolation, what was that like? Yeah, I think, I think it was that hard thing because whilst the isolation really gave us that, that time to really understand what it can be like dealing with such minute details as anxiety, um, it really gave us that understanding of what it could feel like to be alone. And, and I think although such a minute and not as... Um, big of impact as it was, uh, I think that loneliness contributed to how we thought, okay, entering these spaces, how may I feel just a little bit maybe skeptical of entering a space, entering the unknown. I think having a bit of a better understanding of that ourselves, being alone, I think we designed with a little bit more intent for purpose, intent to really allow people to feel a bit more welcomed. So. And Joe? Yeah, I think I think you make good points. So that there's there was an aspect where, you know, in a in community space like architecture is, we we're set in that studio environment where we're always mm -hmm. influencing each other, and not being able to have that ability is, is very is very hard because yeah. you, you are influenced by your your colleagues, um, and I think you kind of you kind of got the iota of aloneness um, of what potential cancer patient, patients may feel when you know they're struggling through these these times. Um, as everyone did through COVID. Um, mm. Yeah, so I think there's, there was a little bit of that. Yeah. And now that you were back to almost being normal, what is the transition like? So designing in isolation yeah. and dealing with a similar brief. If you were given the same brief, but not in isolation, yeah. would you have done it differently? Or what do you think would have changed? I think architecture is, is based around experience. Um, and you design through your experiences. Mm. So. I think we probably would have come up with completely different, yeah. different designs, different models, because I think the very beginning of this project, we, we were asked what, what makes us feel safe, what makes yeah. us feel secure and, you know, a place of solace. Um, yeah. And that came from COVID. It came from the idea of, well, what is hope at this time when I can't see my family, when I can't see my friends? Um, and having, having the experience of, of that has completely changed the design. Yeah, we, we were first initially asked to bring in a, um, an item that inspired hope for us. Yeah. And um, I brought in a flask, a flask that you could fill tea with. And it was something, it's just a small gesture, but something that makes you take a bit of home with you when you step out into the world. And I think it's an interesting question to think about how would it be different now to then? I think the way we bounce off each other in studio and the way how we feed each other's projects with inspiration, I think missing that slightly through digital screen, speaking of a Zoom, we're all doing these digital meetings, uh, sometimes met with a lot of blank screens. I think we weren't able to interact and engage in each other's projects the way that architecture should be engaged with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it'd be, like Joe said, a totally different project, but yeah. Roger, mm -hmm. as a seasoned academic, what was it like to teach during the pandemic? Um, it was tough. Um, I think so much of learning and teaching, <coughs> excuse me, is based upon human interaction. 
And whilst we, at one level we were still interacting, we had a set of different lenses mm -hmm. between us. Yeah. Um, I'm also old enough to be not very good te technologically. So in that sense, I found it a real yeah. struggle. But um, that said, the joy of then coming back post-pandemic or post-pandemic height and coming face to face to with all these brilliant young minds and spirits in studio was an absolute delight. So it kind of proves the adage that this too will be over. Mm. And it kind of is. Yeah. Mm. All right, so I mean, <clears throat> we've got really two beautiful artifacts in front of us and um, mm. a beautiful portfolio here. This portfolio is a body of work of a few students that explored the Maggie Center. So similar to what Roger explained about how different architects um, will receive a brief to design a Maggie Center, this book bears testament to what Roger was saying. It's a collection of beautiful drawings, images that capture what the students, um, they take on the Maggie Center. And here we've got um, Joe's project and Pizzi's project. Yep. Andrew, tell us on how you designed the space, what inspired you? Yeah, so I think um, for me in particular, something that I took away from the brief was this idea that at the heart of any Maggie Center should really lie the kitchen. I think we've touched on it already a little bit, but it's, it's the place of social being in any household. Whenever you gather, the place you tend to congregate is the kitchen, round the table. So I really want to center, center my project around that kitchen. And from that, I like this idea of a pinwheel. And pinwheel architecture is quite common, but seeing how you can capture these different views and maybe different emotional experiences have these different lenses that point out to different directions of the landscape. That's what I was trying to encapture within, within my design. And then around that is, I never wanted to design a building than landscape. I I, they have to be designed at the same time. When they're designed in synchronicity, they really show this beautiful idea of hope. Um, so the way that I wanted to manipulate the topography to create an interior courtyard, where you felt you were outside but not in the public domain of a, of a, car, of a park. So, um, so that pinwheel idea centered around the kitchen with private outdoor air like, spaces, that was really the design tools are behind my design. What about you, Joe? This is one of my favorites as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so with my project, I, I started looking at the architecture through the brief and very looking at the very measured aspects of, of, the, of the design. And what grew from it was something I didn't like. Um, and it wasn't until our trip to Southampton that I actually like, oh, hang on a minute. I'm experiencing this architecture. I'm not. I'm not worried about where the toilets are or where, you know, where I'm going to sit. I'm experiencing the building. Yeah. Um, and that forced me to kind of go away and, and look at Maggie and, and read her book um, and see her experiences. Uh, and what came from it is this idea of connection um, and linking um, a journey of experiences, a decision-making process, um, how to deal with cancer. Um, and I came up with this idea of paper clips that are on my desk. Um, from my concept model that's also sat there. Yeah. Um, and this idea of, 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 of linking those, those two paper clips. And you can link lots of different ones. You can link them all together. You can take them apart. And there's this kind of beauty in the fact of, there is this beauty in the solace, but there's also beauty in the connection of the two. Uh, and from the building design, it's based around that connection and these interlocking links, but that can be separated. Um, so you can have that experience of of joy with other people, but you can escape. You can head underground into these little little pods where you can just be by yourself um, and and take pause. Yeah. Really beautiful. Thanks. That's really beautiful. I think I love the fact that you afford people the options of being with people mm -hmm. or being alone, but also creating the landscape for being alone or creating the landscape, you know, to engage with other people. Roger, um, what, 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 what do you think is the role of landscape in such spaces of healing, um, spiritual spaces? What's the role of landscape in such spaces? I think it's incredibly powerful. About 10 years ago, I was tutoring a student from Denmark, postgrad student, whose mother had passed away two years ago, two years prior to cancer. And she talked to me about the concept of what she called her mother's tree. 
So imagine her mother lying in a hospital bed, terminal diagnosis, and outside was a tree. And she marked the passing of each day by referencing that tree. She marked the passing of the seasons by referencing that tree. And after her mum died, the student said that that tree became a symbol of her mother's existence. But it also made her aware, as a young person, of her place in this huge interconnected ecological pattern of chaos that we kind of sit within. And it kind of exposed the relationship that we have with the world around us. And I think landscape is an incredibly important part of that. And if we look at the Maggie Center in Southampton, it sits on a site which most architects would run away from with great speed. It's a corner of a shabby car park at the back <laughs> of the hospital. But it's been kind of wrapped in a big landscape hug that excludes all this tarmac and motor cars and makes a place within a place within a place. It's like a Russian doll, mm -hmm. yeah? But that kind of landscape barrier is that kind of landscape hug. Yeah. And without that, it would be a much poorer circumstance. Definitely. I mean, from where I come from, um, coming from South Africa, I think, you know, looking at people in rural areas and looking at people in rural conditions, they may not have the houses that we have in suburbia, but they have everything. They've got the landscape, they've got the sea, they live off the land, in some places even, you know. So that ability to be able to live off the land and to give thanks, um, you know, just pays homage to what you're saying about landscape and how that, um, you know, Interestingly, the discovery of photography or the perfection of photography was yeah. based on landscapes yeah. and landscape pictures. And yeah. that's how really um, the lenses for photography were developed. Is landscape played a critical role sure. through um, you know, the discovery and the perfection of photography. Absolutely. With that being said, um, Andrew and Joe, what were some of your favorite projects in the studio from your other classmates? From my other classmates, I, I remember in particular one of mine in my studio, um, it was labelled as the hug and it was all gestured around this idea of a hug and the way that these arms of the structure are kind of wrapped around this central core and this idea of embrace and how we embrace when we first meet each other can be different to how we meet each other later on, maybe five years down the line. And as you enter the building, you're met with a different stage of, embrace, of embracement. And I thought it was a really lovely idea about how we take away this idea almost of embracing from COVID while it was being designed in, in COVID to kind of remind ourselves of how we used to interact physically and now we are almost a bit standoffish. It was a really nice introduction back post-COVID into how, into a nice, a nice way to remember how we used to behave. So I thought that was really special. Yeah, a nice way to actually hug without nudging each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I had the fantastic opportunity of putting together a portfolio, so I got to experience loads of people's work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but some of the ones that really stood out was, uh, was one called The Huddle. Um, and it was like this homogeny of, of different types of buildings, um, all kind of um, inside uh, a rill, um, a, a channel of water. Um, and you had to cross that water in, in order to enter the building. Um, and then around, you had this wall that was protective. So it was almost like that. Um, Zaha Hadid's of kind of a box in a box kind of protective scenario, um, and just a, it just had a great way of of, of building these spaces um, that were again separate from each other but also interactive. Mm. Yeah. That's lovely, Cecil. Have you you know flipped through the book? Did you see anything that really just stood out for you? Yeah. Like I said before, his one was one of my favorites. Um, I just like the idea of the paper clips. It's one of those little things that you see in your house, but you never could think that, oh, a building can be designed from there, you know. I remember when I was doing one of my GCSEs and I was, I was thinking about architecture that can come from the littlest things, like a flower. Um, there's a lotus flower in, I think, in India or Mumbai, and it's designed from a lotus flower. And it sits in this grand gesture of, like, 
it sits in this big way and it makes it and when you pass through it you just see it and you just you're just in awe you know it's architecture that can come from the smallest of things but can make the mightiest of pounds in wherever you are you know you just have to stop and you have to just say wow this is it's there it's, this is it yeah you i know? agree i think some of the greatest sort of um buildings or art pieces were really inspired by the mundane the everyday um yeah. mm. <laughs> ridiculous sure. things Roger. What comes to mind with... Well, can I just come back on Drew's hug? Yeah. So I'm about to retire and go and do other things. And for all of my adult la life, I've had a desire to own a Billy Wilder chair um, designed by Ray and Charles Eames. And I've always admired it as, as a beautiful object. And now I've got one. And you know what? The beauty of the object is now really secondary because when you sit in it, mm. you're sitting in a hug. Mm. Yeah. And it's the most amazing feeling. So I bought it for one reason, but now enjoy it for another reason. Yeah. And I think those subliminal things that we so enjoy as human beings yeah are at the very root of the way that we think about making space and place. All right. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And Roger, thank you very much for making time. Andrew, thank you so much for leaving the studio, hey. leaving your drawings. And Joe, same to you. Thank you so much for coming through. And for everyone watching, be sure to go. Keep watching, keep your eye out on the space, more episodes to follow, more interesting conversation, different studios and different guests. And um, if you want to be a guest, do let us know and you're more than welcome um, to partake in the greater sort of discussions that we'll be having. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.